Hi folks, it's November 2020 and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District US Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm your host Andy, and through all the things that we have lost this year, uh, Core Talk is not one of them. We are still bringing you your people, programs and projects that you know and love coming at you from Norfolk, Virginia. So if you are a hardcore Core Talk listener, um, I guess I'd be a hardcore talk listener. Anyway, you'll notice that we didn't have a episode in October. Reason being is the Norfolk District hosted the district commander's course for this year in October. And there was a lot that came out of that event. So much so that the last couple of weeks we've been taking items that we learned there and people that we met there and creating this episode because there was just so much to talk about and so much to say. So yeah, over the last couple weeks, we put together this multi-chapter episode called Dredging for Compliments because when you have people who love their district and love what they do, they can't help but want to talk about their folks and want to compliment their folks and sing their praises. So we were having a little fun with that. And we took the interviews we had with leaders from around the Corps of Engineers, deputy commanders, district commanders, and even up higher on the chain. And we consolidated it into a five chapter piece. Uh, Chapter one, we're calling How We Delivered. And that's going to be with Colonel Patrick Kinsman from the Norfolk District regarding the DCC. Chapter two, is thoughts from a deputy commander. So there we have Major Warren from the Little Rock District. Chapter three is called Inside the Commander's Studio. You'll have to tune in to find out why. Chapter four is why it all matters. Why do we do all this kind of stuff? We're gonna answer that in chapter four. And chapter five is our teaser segment. That's going to be our awards presentation. Yes, yes folks, the core talk is now in the business of handing out awards to the most shameless self-promoting district (laughs) in the Corps of Engineers and possibly the most fun district to talk to. So you have to check that out to see who it is. Now, all those, uh, the timeline of where they fall, those chapters can be found in the show notes. In addition to all all the pertinent links and relevant information that you'll need to guide you during the show. Again, keep in mind during this episode, it was recorded over about four weeks. So you'll hear me popping in here and there and explaining what's going on and give you a little context in the areas where it's needed. Now we did try with this episode to include as much video as possible. So if you're able, I recommend checking this episode out on YouTube. Let's get to Core Talk November episode, Dredging for Compliments. It's one week after the district commander's course, and I'm glad that you were able to uh, get some time and and meet and talk about everything that happened during that uh, long and really exciting week. But I wanted to start out with asking you a basic question. What is the district commander's course? And tell us a little bit of background about it, as well as what the Norfolk district did to support it. Oh, great. So, um, well, thanks, Andrea. And uh, I guess I'm still kind of on a high, if you will, because I I think the district just did a a, just a fantastic job supporting what is really uh, a enterprise or or an effort that is really across the entire U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And so I I guess really by way of background, a year ago, the Norfolk District got this uh, mission and um, that mission is really part of how uh, in one aspect that we take care of our, our military leaders. So our, com- our new commanders and our new deputies, about a, a, you know, a third of which uh, rotate every year. 
uh, the new commanders uh, and deputies for our uh, districts across the Corps of Engineers. They arrived this summer and the commanders got some initial training basically right before they took over in June. But this mission that we had, the district commanders course for both commanders and deputies is really uh, one of the key ways that we educate those military commanders in their new their new roles. And so it's, again, Corps of Engineers, a huge a mission that's got a lot of breadth to it. It's a deliberate way that we bring the commanders and deputies in to talk about that mission and really so that they can learn at the, in the first, after the, about the first 90 days of their time uh, in the district. From, I've been with the district now for about two years. And what has amazed me about our mission, and, and I'm just speaking about the Norfolk district, is we're working from bridges to breakwaters to buildings. What were some of the speakers or what were some of the, the topics that you touched on during the event? Yeah, well, that's, yeah, so that's really it. And one of the great things, again, uh, being a district commander that's been in two years now, I really got a chance to propose a schedule. And then um, General Hill, the deputy commander of the Corps of Engineers, really approved it. But um, we asked, and, and our new chief of engineers, Lieutenant General Spellman, the 55th chief, uh, he was able to come down here from uh, from Washington and really spend a couple hours uh, with the new commanders and deputies talking about his own view of the Corps, his priorities for uh, the Corps of Engineers and where you know he's going to focus his effort uh, in his coming four-year assignment. We had, again, General Hill, who's the uh, the deputy commander of the Corps. We had General Milhorn, who's the military programs chief, uh, General Graham, the civil works you know, lead for the Corps. Um, so a lot of, um, I guess, senior military and senior civilian leaders to really cover, you know, that breadth of the Corps. So, you know, you talk about the, the, the core mission, real estate, you know, we're the Army's real estate agent. The senior civilian, Ms. Brenda Johnson Turner, leads our real estate community of practice, was able to come down and, and really provide her you know, insights and, and thoughts about what's happening in the real estate program, again, to uh, to the commanders uh, as an example. So district commanders with two years in uh, talk specifically about some of the things that are going on in our military construction portfolio. So dams, waterways, wetlands, regulatory, we're a permitting agency. There's a lot of things that the Corps does. And so we're giving those new commanders as much as we can after their 90 days. And you also had them PT, I noticed. Well, absolutely. So we had, we, you know, squeezed in a fun run from uh, downtown Norfolk to our historic Fort Norfolk that is located right here next to our Norfolk district headquarters. Um, Our last episode, we did, we had a special on Fort Norfolk. So for those commanders who were on that run and and got to come down and and see our little piece of history, maybe they should check out that, uh, that last core talk we met. You know, we, for our, our program manager that really looks after the fort, we brought Craig Jones out early in the morning. So where the commanders and deputies all ran in, we had them grab a bottle of water. Craig talked to him for, you know, uh, 10 or 15 minutes about the history of the fort. And then we said, OK, time to run back. Good opportunity. I'm assuming that's the, the fun part of the run. <laughs> So what I thought was amazing when I was there for the event was you managed to include everyone in a COVID-19 friendly environment. You had, we had folks there, you, you hosted an on-site event and then we're able to take that and make it essentially a worldwide event, keeping everybody tuned in and keeping everybody safe. Tell me a little bit how that came about. How did you have the ideas? And and tell us how 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 you managed to keep everybody safe. Well, top priorities, people. Jim McConville's made that clear. General Spellman, he talked about that as well. And certainly, leaders in the Corps have been watching the COVID nineteen situation, you know, closely since March. You know, it was something I obviously was personally, uh, you know, uh, concerned about, and, and really you know, wanted to make sure that, that we did, you know, well. So we were watching, again, the numbers here in the Hampton Roads area. As we got to the spring, we really said, you know, we've got to offer both an in-person and a virtual option. So we ended up 38 commanders and deputies, 32, again, roughly were in-person and six or so were virtual. You know, some folks just couldn't travel, particularly folks in Europe, folks in the Pacific. 
uh, went virtual, you know, and then the, the, we worked closely with the, the hotel. I mean, they, the hotel was just, again, fantastic partners. We had people spaced out. We had microphones. So, you know, people didn't have to really raise their voice. Of course, uh, guidelines for washing your hands and hand sanitizer and uh, the value of having those commanders uh, and deputies in to meet, again, at six feet, but to really be able to exchange ideas face to face. I think that will pay off for for years to come. Yeah, I found that the way it was set up, and as you point out, working with the hotel and all the work they did with us, having these extra steps in place to keep people safe, it didn't seem to inhibit the goals of the event. It seemed like everybody not only was compliant, but there was still that esprit de corps feeling, and there was still that communication, open form. So I thought that was that was really interesting, and it was something that I got a chance to take away. From the event was um, using technology, the the different districts and divisions' interest in technology in order to go forward with our mission. Um, what do you? What would you hope that the attendees would take away from the event? Yeah, well, um, and, and just uh, you know, on the virtual uh, aspect of it, again, I, I probably remiss and just recognizing really that our entire Norfolk team who put a lot of energy and effort. Uh, into that ability to have Colonel Dagan from Europe wanted to ask a question, right? It came out of speakers in the room there, and it was clear as, as anything. It's almost like, you know, he uh, he was there. So the, the team's effort in testing Stacey English from the USACE Learning Center, her efforts, you know, really to get all the, the people connected in were really, uh, it was really vital to, uh, you know, to, to being able to execute. But I think to your question, like, what are the main takeaways? I mean, well, I would say collaboration. We heard that from a number of the panel members, from a lot of, from our stakeholder. Um, you know, we spent some time with um, the Virginia Ports Authority, and, and they really talked about, you know, the collaboration required in the 21st century, right? It's got to be the attitude of kind of rolling up your sleeves and with your stakeholders or partners that you're working together on a project and really being transparent, talking through challenges and agreeing on a, you know, on a way ahead. And then when there are challenges that can't be resolved at a certain level, we've got to, you know, raise them up. So I think partnership uh, and collaboration, I think were one of the, one of the biggest takeaways that, uh, that came out of it. Yes, ma'am. I am Major Shotone Warren. I'm the Deputy District Commander for the Little Rock District with the Corps of Engineers. Let our listeners know a little bit about your district. Tell us what y'all got going on down there. So I, I would tell you right now, Little Rock is just one of those unique places. Um, we hear Little Rock and we sometimes think it's just a little piece of thing that's going on. But um, Little Rock is a subordinate commander of the United States Corps of Engineers. And right now we, we are underneath Southwestern Division. Uh, we've been serving in Little Rock, uh, most of Arkansas and Southern Missouri since uh, we were established since 1881. Uh, we employ approximately 800 civilians that provide vital public engineering services and peace and war to strengthen our nation's security, energize the economy, and most importantly, reduce the risk from disaster. And we have a multitude of just uh, different uh, disciplines that are inside of our, our, our organization, ma'am. What would you say are some of the really interesting projects that you guys have going on right now in the Little Rock District. So we have a couple of things going on now, ma'am. And I would tell you one of the most important things that we, um, just, I'll, I'll talk successful things here. One of the key projects is um, our Ozark Major Rehab Project. Uh, this project is very unique and uh, has been a significant challenge with us. Um, it began back in 2005, so way before my time in the Corps and before I even entered the United States Army. But this project was in 2005, and um, the goal was to replace the five turbines, rehab the cranes, and replace and rehab supporting equipment. Um, thus far, I would tell you we have um, been able to rehab and complete three of the five turbines with one additional turbine that's in the currently in the testing phase now. And despite it being started in 2005, we're thinking now, December 2020, we're going to be done with this project, ma'am. So a lot of uh, effort and momentum been put into this this project, ma'am. So tell me, what about with the Ozark, like, 
that's um like energy that because <laughs> coming from the PA background, these are just like en energy turbines. Or tell me a little bit about them. Okay, so turbines they're very central to what we do um, each and every day. And I would just tell you a little bit about these turbines. That's enough power that we're doing to put power in approximately almost 350,000 households each and every year. Um, so the cost savings to that is about $220, $220 million a year as a means of generating this power. It's very important to do that. And with the seven power plants that we have, um, that's that's the greatest thing. And, and I would segue and talk about a successful thing we're doing with that is, um, so the MCORNs is a system uh, that we have right now we kind of usually navigate with. So the MCORNs, it's the uh, McClellan Kerr Arkansas River Navigation System. Kind of funny to say, but that's what MCORNs is. And it's, um, it's a part of the United States Inland Water System, and uh, it's originating at the Tulsa Port of Catoosa, and it runs southeast through Oklahoma and Arkansas and goes as far to the Mississippi River. Um, the total length of this system is 445 miles. Um, it was named after two, citizens, uh, two senators, uh, Senator Robert Kerr uh, from Oklahoma and um, Joe McClellan, who's from Arkansas. And the system officially opened in June of uh, 1971. And so next year, the important thing about this system is we're going to do a six month celebration from, you know, 1 January through 30 June next year, just celebrating 50 years of just service that the MCORN has provided. Now, how long, how long is the, um, the, the MCORN, how long is that, is it channel or? No, so the MCORN system is the inland water system. And right now it spans uh, the length of 445 miles right now. So just think about the amount of the barges that kind of come through every year and what we're able to do with this, this system here. And it's just like it runs clearly through from, from our, our neighboring partners in Tulsa, as well as Oklahoma, down to Arkansas, to the Mississippi River. So we're crossing at least three or four different districts that, you know, have to communicate with this, with holding back hydropower and water, with preventing flood uh, damage and everything that we do there. So it's a lot of communication that we do, and that's one of the beautiful parts about the Corps is, that cross uh, pollination of information and an easy sharing of information. Because what's happening in Tulsa affects what we have here in Arkansas, essentially. So that constant day-to-day -day feedback is, is critical to what we do. Um, and with this, you know, we talk about the communication, why it's so important. Um, the Corps of Engineers, we've known and sometimes when, you know, when bad things happen, you hear the flood, the Corps of Engineers just flooded us out again. Um, it's, for one, it's not the Corps. And number two, they don't understand and see what we're doing to prevent a lot of things. So I would say and, and, and change the narrative that um, with working with Tulsa and with working with Memphis, with working with ourselves and other um, usage districts, I would tell you it's about 12 different 12 reservoirs that we have in our backyard. Every year, it could be a flood. However, on an annual basis, we're about $78 million per year. That's not, that's not seen because you don't see that, that, you know, water not in your, in your kitchen or your living room. Um, that's just because of the preventive things that we're doing. And I agree. And that's coming into the core myself from not knowing that much about it, I did not realize all the items that the core takes care of for in, in the community at large. So we you know in Norfolk district, we say from breakwaters to buildings to bridges, the core is there taking care of this, as you said, behind the scenes a lot of times. You, yes, and I, I like just hearing you, you're at the Little Rock district and you're talking about this major navigation and hydropower asset that you have going on, that's not something that the average person does know. So I'm glad that you're you're here on Core Talk and, and talking about that and showcasing that. Yes, um, and additionally, I'll add and say, you know, outside of just the hydropower that we're generating, other things that we're doing also is uh, we're also managing about 750,000 acres of public land and water each and every year, as well as um, about hydropower, as I said before, to about 350,000 households and uh, preventing about $7 million um, in annual uh, flood damages. Also, we have about 18 million people that visit our, our different parks and recreation, um, as well as managing $6.5 billion worth of public infrastructure. This infrastructure includes 12 reservoirs, uh, 13 navigation locks and dams, the seven hydropower plants we talked about, 164 public parks, and 308 miles of navigational channel. So it's a lot that we do as a civil works district as well. Are there any um, military construction projects that come to mind off the top of your head right now? So we do some right now. We do some military construction out at um, the Little Rock Air Force Base right now. Good deal. So the, the Corps seems to have their hand in, hand in a little bit of everything. So I do oh, have to ask, 
Um, now you were recently at the district commander's course and as you, when you were there, you saw we had the, the six feet um, distance between uh, the different participants, as well as all the other COVID-19 measures in place to make sure everybody was, was safe. What is the Little Rock District doing to keep the progress going and the processes going amid the COVID-19 pandemic? So, so first I wanna come back and give kudos just to the, the Norfolk District as well. First off, the course was, it, was a wonderful course that was put together and it was put together with safety in mind to just take away the, or, or the burden that people may have of you know, being scared to you know, participate, but you guys took away all the fears and anything that we kind of just had any apprehensive about, apprehensiveness about. It was very well orchestrated. And uh, as you meant, mentioned, it was uh, spaced out distant wise to accommodate the, the personnel inside of the room to just have a free flow of information. Um, so I would say similar to that, that's the, the Little Rock District also, we're doing the same thing, which is for one, we, we have maximized the telework um, across the district. But I would tell you with, with maximizing work and with less per people inside the offices, the work has not stopped and it hasn't degraded, not even one bit. So that's the kudos just to the committed civilians that we have to do what they do every day here inside of our district. And I couldn't be more proud of them and what they do every day to kind of contribute, contribute to their part to the team. So what do you think, I know that the district commander's course was, it was pretty intense. Y'all were quite busy for that week. What were some of the takeaways or lessons learned that you gained from that event that you're gonna bring back to, to uh, Little Rock? Um, I would tell you the first thing that, um, that the group kind of put on and kind of let us know that for one, they care about us, they are invested. They're invested with us, with having the multiple mentors that kind of came in from the chief on down to his deputy to kind of come in and provide those uh, candid feedback and those stories. What I learned most important was we're not alone. Here's about a buddy that can help you out for any questions that you may have. Um, and most importantly, we got a chance to network as well with one another with our with my peers as deputies. And I can't can't be remiss if I don't you know say that Norfolk did a great job just having a great itinerary lined out important for those that are new to the core, but also what to expect after on about 90 days of being a deputy, having a melting pot of information which was only for the for the betterment of the organization as well as the people. So it was, it was, it was an event of collaboration of, of about learning and building those partnerships. How does that, how does that collaboration and that part, a uh, sense of partnership and understanding of it, how does that impact let's, a, a civil works project? How would you explain that to maybe someone in the community who says, hey, you know, I, I'm a taxpayer and I want to know how what you guys did there is going to impact me and my family. So I would say the thing that we do is um, our advocates for that are based on employees. So we've had times I would go back to the flood of 2019. Uh, we had local employees that they're not just guys that came, that came in TDY. These are people that live here also. So we use them as our sounding board to kind of go that when we have our engagements out with the, with the field or with the local residents. Uh, we let people know for one what's going on, and we're just very, you know, transparent with what's going on. But also, we're doing it with the face of people that, you know, potentially could be their neighbors, church members, or anybody, or anything else that they're tied to this problem, and they're going to see it from cradle to grave to the point where any incident that happens, we're going to be here with you until this is over. Now, aren't you local or close? Like, aren't you? Where are you from, sir? So I would tell you now what what like I tell the employees here. I'm just as equally invested as employees that we have in the Little Rock District. I'm, I'm extremely blessed to be one of the ones that had a chance to work and give back to the great state that's invested in me, which is Arkansas. So I'm from Arkansas originally. And so this is a very, uh, you know, near and dear assignment that's near and dear to my heart. I take it personal because this is the backyard and it's a place that invested in me and my family. Um, down the street, I went to, to the school of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. There I met my, my wife and we've been together for almost 20 years now. And just I would tell you, uh, this state is phenomenal. And what makes it phenomenal is the great people here. And also just my job with having just great employees here. And I would tell you that, that crystal clear uh, communication along the way has, has been phenomenal. And to see the way they respond and take care of one another, it's, I haven't seen anything like it. Uh, coming home, I wasn't sure what to expect with, you know, working with the Corps of Engineers because I didn't think I would, you know, be here at this date and time. But I would tell you, this is truly the right place to be. And I'm not saying it just for green suitors, but also just attracting the right talent to come here. If you're thinking about Little Rock, this is definitely a place you want to come to. Let's talk about, we were talking about communication. 
And we're talking about how to operate in the COVID-19 environment, as well as some of the, of the things that we did at the district commander's course. How do you see um, communication in the future as we, as we navigate the world during COVID-19, but then after? We, I know the core is, we often use the word revolutionize. So in your opinion and from what you've seen and experienced, how do you see the core revolutionizing how we communicate now and into the future? One thing I have seen um, just with, with the Corps of Engineers this time here, we're always out front. And when I say that we're always out front, uh, we've gotten away from just the routine of everybody in the building just because COVID has gotten a vote. And we want to take care of our most precious resource, which is our people. And that's important. But I would say with maximize telework and having multiple means of just communicating, if it's WebEx, if it's Skype, if it's Google Meets, whatever it is, I'll tell you, we've kind of explored those different ways to just still be connected, to see the people still, and still communicate and get the job done collaboratively. And it, it's, it's, it's invaluable just to still uh, see what the employees are able to do. I'm equally uh, just impressed by their work ethic as well as their commitment to what they do. And we haven't let COVID just steal everything from us. Uh, we still get up every day and go to work and still get after our, our assigned missions, man. I really like hearing that. That like that inspires me. <laughs> it makes me feel Yeah, good. I would tell you, because our people, you know, we, we talk about so many times what's been very important to us. And we're going to deliver the program. We are. But the other thing to do that is, is check it on our most precious resource. And that's our employees, knowing that, hey, we care and, we, um, and we're and we in this fight with you. And with these different platforms we're able to use, um, we're not just picking up phones. Like I say, I can you know, pick up a, my computer and I can pull up and see somebody right there right away to know that, hey, Ali's okay over here doing whatever. And we can collaborate together and see each other still exchange the great ideas across the enterprise and uh, only for the betterment of what we do. And so that's very important. And um, our, our, our employees are, are what matters most to us. As I talk about Little Rock Bend, it's a great place uh, of doing uh, professional expertise in, in helping the region and nation meet their water resource demands military construction requirements, environmental safeguards, and engineering needs. We also uh, we support for others, recreation, contracting, regulatory, navigation, hydropower, and di disaster prevention and response. But with that, I, I'm, I'm, my plug to that is, what a lot of things we're doing right now to attract talent and assume the role of the chief of operations. Um, secondly, we have a chief, the chief of contracting. That position will become open later this year uh, towards the later, latter part of, of this calendar year 20. But I would tell you, the contracting team here do a phenomenal job of helping us deliver the program and meet that need. And um, that, chief, that chief seat for the chief of contracting is definitely another critical position that we have for us. And if there's any talent or anybody else that's thinking about it or have the same skill sets or expertise, we're looking forward to potentially looking to have you on, our, on the Little Rock team. So we'll put that we'll put the um, all that hiring information for the Little Rock District down in our show notes. So hopefully we can find you that perfect fit. Yes, ma'am. I definitely truly appreciate that and what you're doing. I think this podcast, what you guys are doing is, again, this is that cutting, you know, cutting edge, being in front of things and finding different mediums to talk and uh, allowing us to still, despite what's going on, have a voice. And I, I can't thank you guys enough for what you guys do and your commitment. Impressed and I stay impressed by what you guys seem to accomplish each and every day. And that's what you're doing, but even in my backyard here with, with the Little Rock District, man. It's it's what more you ask for. Good people, good mission. You know, that's 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 pretty much yeah. top. So what I heard you say was you have the best job in the United States Army Corps of Engineers with being being in the PAO realm. You guys yes, get the chance to see it firsthand, tell it, see it, uh, and get in front of it early on. So I'm I'm jealous for the things you guys get to do as well. You guys have more good day in your life. invite two guests to CORE Talk today from the St. Louis District. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourselves? All right. Uh, I'm Susan Wilson. I'm the Deputy District Engineer or DPM for the district. I've been with the CORE uh, over 15 years and have worked uh, in all our major divisions from project management to operations to uh, engineering and construction. All right, great, Susan, thanks. And hey, I'm uh, Carl Kevin Gullen, we're some new commander that came on board this summer in July of 2020. Quite a year to be joining a new organization. 
Uh, but it's really been an honor and really a joy to join this great team in St. Louis. I'm from the Midwest, uh, up river, up the Mississippi River, up in the Quad City, Danport, Iowa, originally. And so I kind of feel like home here in the Midwest uh, and joining this great team. Uh, so glad to be here today with you. Thanks so much for taking the time to um, learn more about the St. Louis District and what we're doing here in the region. It's actually the day before Veterans Day when we're recording this. So everybody's kind of getting ready for that day off. So I do appreciate the time that y'all are taking out to, uh, to just do a little chatting. Um, first question is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you guys the chance to brag about your district. So, sir, we'll start with you. Tell me a little bit about the district in your own words. And then I want to hear about what projects really have you excited. And ma'am, feel free to cut him off with interesting details or facts or anything that you just can't hold back that you need to tell the Core Talk audience about. All right, sir, I'm going to pass you the Pass you the microphone. All right. Well, hey, great. Thanks again for this time. You know, I, again, the district has about 650 to 700 plus professionals. And that's really you know, number one, most important I'm proud about is the people that we have. What a great team. Um, and then in the region here, it's mostly Eastern Missouri and uh, Central Illinois. Um, and so really kind of what we focus on is this terrain here is, is the river, right? So 300 miles of the Mississippi River. We, we see the confluence of the Missouri coming in. Uh, a section of the Illinois River that we we monitor and help uh, provide support for here in the region. Uh, you know, really one of the things I, I liked coming on board was you know, keeping it simple. And so the team kind of explained to me, we, you know, today, sir, we do three things. We protect people from the water, right? And so that's our flood risk management mission. And, you know, it's a whole lot more to it, uh, but we that's I like that uh, kind of upfront. You know, we have a lot of flooding, a lot of concerns in the region here. Uh, number two is we protect that water from people. And that's kind of the environmental mission. How do we make sure that there is a good process for development and, and regulatory uh, mission to make sure what we're going to do in this area makes sense in the long term and take care of the environment. And then lastly, we make water useful. And that's that's definitely a very important mission for the nation, for the economy, is the navigation up and down these rivers uh, is so vital. And so I'll, I'll kind of stop there and pause. There's so much more, so many, so much variety and, and work that we do, but I liked that simplicity up front and, and, and what we do. All right, ma'am, tell us a little bit more because it sounds like, you know, your deal is water. You guys are like the Poseidon of the uh, of the Corps of Engineers. I don't know, maybe I'm a little extra here, but tell me more about uh, some of your missions. Is there any specific project that just really fires you up or that you're working on right now you people know about? Um, I think one of our major projects that we're working on, we refer to as Metro East uh, flood projects. And it's actually a series of projects uh, on the Mississippi River that provide flood protection and they all deal with under seepage. So we're going in and making sure, you know, that we fix the under seepage issues, whether it is uh, through cutoff walls, relief wells, um, pump stations. So it's a combination of features. Uh, we're, we're to the point where the majority of the projects are fully funded or close to it. So we're in construction, which is a really exciting point. Uh, to be, uh, we've worked really hard to get to this point, but got a great dedicated team that's working on that project. So I think that's one of them. Uh, another project would be St. Louis Riverfront. Uh, we had a feasibility study that was approved by the chief a year ago. So we're, you know, working towards that pro pro uh, point where we can get to construction, um, you know, but really it's a great project. It's an ecosystem restoration project. Um, so we would come in and, you know, help uh, make sure that the river is able to provide a recreation features that people are interested in uh, and keep uh, lead from migrating down to the Mississippi River. So yes, you truly are the water people. See, I wouldn't have thought that. I just was, just, I have to ask you now, I'm, um, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, Philly area. So water stuff just isn't, I don't know a lot about it. So I tend to really find it fascinating and ask some questions. So if my questions are silly, just bear with me. But the first thing you were talking about under seepage. So I, mean, I think I know what that, that feels like there's water underneath the ground, but there's probably more to that. So can you expand upon that a little bit for our audience? All right, um, I think an easy way to talk about it would be you've got the water that's on the river side and we don't want it coming through the levee in an uncontrolled fashion. So where it comes up with like say a sand boil where that water is bubbling up uh, in an uncontrolled fashion. So that's why we come in and we put these features 
uh, such as a relief well that controls that water or a cutoff wall, which prevents the water from being able to come through. Um, or the, the third feature that we use is seepage berm. So that provides a blanket of weight and that makes that water have to go further to come out so that it is still controls it. So those are kind of the simple explanations. A big restoration project, the Lynn Haven River Ecosystem Restoration Project is connected to Chesapeake Bay Health. So when you say restoration, I'm, I'm, I'm learning about that and we're really into that right now. Um, do, do you mind expanding upon that restoration project? Tell me a little bit more about it. So Susan, I'll take a, a stab and then uh, ask you to, to fill in any, uh, any details. You know, and it, it is great to show the balance, you know, where Susan just explained uh, the flood risk management and you know, flooding up and down the Mississippi River, it's much more visible. And it's been like that since the flood of 93, right? Massive flood that impacted the region. And the one thing I'll just kind of close out about the, that side a little bit before I go into the ecosystem is that, uh, you know, what I've learned and gained appreciation for is the last four or five years, 2015, 17, 19, we've had tremendous flooding in this region. Um, but thankfully, due to all the work over the last couple of decades, we haven't seen as um, um, severe damage as it was back in 93. And so that's a, a testament to the work that the district and others have done in the region. Um, so that's that navigation, keeping the navigation going and keeping the flood risk management uh, work, uh, keeping the river within bounds as much as possible. Uh, but on the ecosystem side and environment, since you asked, uh, I will kind of zero in on, we kind of call it the St. Louis Riverfront Merrimack River Project. Uh, but it's really isolated on the big river. And that's in Southeast Missouri. Years ago, there was a lot of development uh, in, in mines that caused over time some contamination. And so working with the state of Missouri, with the EPA and other partners to try to figure out how, how do we mitigate that? How do we limit the, the spread of that down river, down the big river to the Merrimack to ultimately to go into the Mississippi River? Uh, and so there's some indicators with mussels and other um, uh, wildlife that we, there's concerns. And so we are excited to work with other partners and really help again to take care of the environment over time uh, in that ecosystem re restoration. So Susan, anything else that you want to highlight with that? No, I think you captured it great. Um, I guess I'll expand on mussel habitat. I mean, they're, they're really prime indicators of the health of your river. Um, people often don't think about them, um, but you know, I know our biologists are super excited about the variety of species that are on the river, it's prime habitat. Um, you know, so that's one of the things that we're trying to protect uh, through a series of features such as bank stabilization, uh, you know, making sure that um, we're keeping the banks in place and we're able to restore the habitat and make sure that it provides, um, you know, a good environment for uh, both the species and then human recreation side. It's interesting. So I, I interviewed uh, Portland District a while back and it seems like, you know, in, in Norfolk, we're all about our oysters. So our oysters are your muscle, are their salmon. It, that, that communication between the environment, as we're still delivering on the nation's needs, uh, engineering needs, but keeping that environment, our ear to the ground or to the water, as it were, to, to listen to what our friends are, are letting us know about the health of, of, of where they're living. So that is, that's, that's very cool. Um, do you guys have, STEM is really, it always brings me to STEM because I have two little ones. Do you guys have a, a STEM program or an outreach program related to the mussels or anything you're doing on the ecosystem-wide side of the house? I mean, we have a really, um, it's, pro it's an award-winning STEM program. Um, we've won several national level awards for our program. So we really try and hit from the very littlest all the way, we have a preschool that's in our building. So during engineers week, we go in, we read to the preschoolers, um, to high school programs. We've, we've had a program where we have uh, high school students that come in and they do some of their work school experience with us. And we actually have one that we've ended up hiring uh, with us after he's graduated college. So he's gone, you know, from us being a senior in high school, you know, to now being a full-time employee. Um, so all through the ages, we have a variety of programs that we do, uh, you know, trying to make sure that um, people are aware of, of the opportunities and then all the benefits, uh, you know, that STEM can provide. So you guys are providing not only engineering products, but cradle to grave education and environmental stewardship for, uh, for the next generation. That's uh, like pretty much what aren't you guys doing in St. Louis? Sounds like you've got everything, everything covered. And of course, we, we mentioned this, and, and, and sir, you and I spoke about this yesterday. It, it comes down to the kind of people that, that make that district. So, 
So I wanted to take a minute and have you tell me a little bit about what kind of folks you have there uh, in the St. Louis district. Who are the folks who are boots on the ground making all these, all these cool projects and all this stuff actually happen? It's a great question. We have uh, you know, just you know, being the Corps of Engineers, I think a lot of people think we have just all engineers, right? So, uh, and Susan kind of alluded to while STEM is important, it really is a lot of different fields that uh, um, come together, you know, to deliver a project. And so, uh, while engineers are a critical part of that, this, that equation and then and the projects, uh, we also have folks that are program managers, that are contract specialists, uh, that deal with real estate challenges. Uh, we have, you know, an office of the council that su supports what we're doing. So, Really, what up, it's been exciting to see is the, the diversity of types of skills and the types of people that we have coming together to um, have these multifunctional uh, product delivery teams um, to really help make sure that uh, you know the engineering is sound, that we keep the program, the project on track, uh, and that you know the critical component of the funding is, is on track as well. And so, um, I would say we do have um, you know a preponderance of our people are from this area. Uh, we recruit and have uh, folks uh, from Central Illinois and, and, and certain universities in, in Missouri here as well that have a lot of uh, pride in where they're coming from and the schools that, that they're part of. But one area I'd like to highlight um, is the expeditionary work we're doing outside the region. And uh, because of supplemental work uh, in Jacksonville District and the amount of work, we had the opportunity to partner with them in Puerto Rico. And over you know, many years from the recovery work going down there and then now the supplemental work district is doing. We've also created a relationship with the university down there in Puerto Rico in which uh, we've been able to recruit and have some talented you know, folks come from uh, Puerto Rico. And then it's so rewarding that many of them are now able to work on the projects down there um, back on the island. And so, and, and Susan, you want to talk a little more about our great uh, people as well? Uh, yeah, I think one area that uh, we need to make sure we mention is, you know, our lock operators, those that work out in the field, those that are on our dredge, um, you know, they make sure that that navigation mission that the colonel mentioned earlier is supported. Um, you know, they, they're working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, you know, if the weather's cold and icy, uh, COVID, you know, whatever's going on, they're out there. Um, archivists, archaeologists, you know, we cover the full spectrum. Um, you know, all different types of biologists uh, that work in a variety from either regulatory to planning. Uh, the project management variety of areas. So just a, a wealth of knowledge, um, but also one of those things that we try when we're doing the skin outreach is to say, it's not just a matter of being an engineer. Or if it is an engineer, we have a variety of engineers, you know, um, all different types. Within civil, there's a, a full range of things you can do from structural to H&H &H, uh, to geotechnical. So um, we really try and make sure, you know, people are aware of the options that we have, um, but really do have a great workforce with a, a variety of backgrounds. Yeah, I, I, before I came to work for the Corps of Engineers, I didn't know so many kinds of engineers existed. It's like, what do you do? You're an engineer. But that's what I thought. And then it's like, oh, hey, hydraulics and hydrology, civil, electrical. It's just, it's, it's fascinating to be able to, to see all that. And, and what I heard you say, sir, and what I heard you kind of back them up with, Susan, is it's a diverse group of people that it takes to make that mission come into fruition and make all these things happen. And when we talk diversity, it's we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about inclusion because the, we're noticing you know, the importance of making sure we have both going on um, as, as humans in the world, but also to have, to, to have our, our mission, like I say, mission come into fruition to be one of the things you said, sir, that really I thought was interesting, we were talking about the district commander's course and we brought up how, and you you use the term hybrid when talking about the communicate. And I just thought that was on point and fascinating. So I wanna make sure I give you credit for that. What are some of the takeaways as far as how information was communicated during the DCC? What are some takeaways, if any, that you, you gained from that, that you could, incorporate into your time as as commander here? Well, so I would say that uh, the Norfolk District did a great job of demonstrating that we can do things in person, you know, safely at uh, a time of COVID with proper distance and masks and so forth. But, uh, you know, we had several uh, fellow commanders that couldn't be in their person as they were at overseas locations. And so and I won't take full credit for the hybrid uh, terminology. I've 
heard and seen others you know doing that but i i, I that was a big takeaway for me the district commander course was uh was that hybrid model uh that we're trying to implement in the district and, and realizing wanting to keep people safe and, and and help them stay engaged as uh best possible so the pre-command course was all virtual this summer and um you know that was a decision that was uh, right at the time uh so but i applaud norfolk we're taking that step and headquarters are proving us to be uh, together in person. But by the end of the week, we realized those that were online, we had to be really intentional to make sure that they were being included for questions and had an opportunity to really feel like they were there as much as possible. And so that, that's a, a lesson, you know, for us in the district and across the core to make sure that uh, we are balancing that uh, you know, meeting people in person and, and online and, 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 and really learning and improving this new way of doing business as we move forward. And man, many takeaways for like, I, I know you, you weren't at the course, but as far as communication in this this evolving environment where what we used to do is not how we do business now and things are changing and what have you changed or modified in how you do business in, in amid COVID-19 or other interests as far as including the full population? I think one of the big things that, um, you know, I've realized is before I walked around a lot in the district office and would see people in the halls and talk to them. And sometimes that talk is just, you know, how their personal life is going. Um, and with so much of the workforce still being from home, you know, I've had to turn to other mediums, um, you know, to do that. So whether it's using, you know, video technology so that we can see each other, um, you know, picking up the phone instead of just an email, it's easy to just send an email and say, you know, how are things going? Um, but you get much more personal discussion, much more in depth, um, you know, when you're talking face to face or on the phone. Um, so really trying to use those tools and trying to encourage the workforce to make sure that they continue to have those uh, non-work connections, you know, that that uh, water, co uh, water cooler talk that you may have had before, uh, you know, trying to make sure in meetings that that still is a part of things because it's easy just to focus on work. Uh, and if we lose that personal connection, um, I don't think that benefits us. So really trying to encourage that is realizing it's going to be uh, a longer time before some of the workforce is back in the office. And I, and I wanted to add, as I came on board, uh, we were starting to have um, up to about 40, 45% of people in, in person, but then uh, right before the change of command, uh, you know, the team made a decision to drop back to a phase uh, phase zero in which we really, you know, had mission essential folks um, and, and had been that like that for quite a while. Um, one thing that has persisted is every Tuesday morning, we'd have a district telecon, um, 30, 40 minutes, um, and it's, you know, updating uh, the entire team. Now, not everyone can log on every week, uh, but it's been just that steady drumbeat of updating and, and, and kind of focusing on those key priorities and key updates uh, for those that, that want to and can dial in each week. Uh, and then this afternoon, we're going to be having a town hall. Uh, and so more of the WebEx uh, platform, uh, but then kind of a highlight of the last year, just, you know, even with COVID, all the work that was done, helping to, you know, helping our employees to know, you know, they've had their focus area, but have them, you know, keep their head up and understand across the board what the district has accomplished together, even through these tough times. And so, really impressed with uh, the leaders and the engagement to try to uh, when folks are teleworking um, out of the district office they're still still kept informed uh, and then i'll go back to what susan said before the folks that are at the field sites really haven't missed the beat you know they've been working hard to uh, change the work environment to keep themselves safe to keep the public safe uh, but really had record uh, engagement with the public at our lakes uh, and and across uh, the region and so we appreciate their ability to adapt and uh, and still continue that mission um, you know, and, and really the kind of the face of the district, the face of the core that are out there. We have five major uh, lakes that are flood control reservoirs that fit into the, the system of controlling that water uh, throughout the year. And um, really amazing to see the impact they have on the local community, the partners they have within their respective regions uh, and how they, you know, are really representing us well out there. Yeah, amid this, the craziness that is 2020, I can definitely say, I think the core vendors in general has really has really shown through and had some successes because the folks we have and this is this is how much of a dork i am as a public affairs person i was working out this morning on the elliptical watching general seminite's interview with rachel maddow again on youtube like, like oh he did really good he really you know he got right to the point because that's that's what we do in the core vendors we love what we do we kind of dork out about it a little bit but that's what makes us a special group of people so 
uh, we're talking about making sure we have that, you know, we still have these relationships during a time when we can't just drop by the cubicle and, and just even grab a cup of coffee, the people we work with. So have you guys ever seen the, the show? It's not on anymore. I don't think it was, it was called In the Actor's Studio. Have you seen this? Were they so, oh, it's not gonna be as impactful. So it was a show that used to be on where they take these famous actors and they'd ask them really serious questions. And, and the, the host was this really serious guy. And he would ask these deep things. And then at the end of the episode, he would ask them these kind of silly questions. And so we're gonna do that today. So <laughs> I have three questions and Susan, you're gonna be first. Okay. So, and this is where you have to go on and Google in the actor's studio if you're not doing it already. I sir, I see you're looking down typing. So cheater, cheater, pumpkin eater. Um, so my first question for Susan, and then sir, we'll go to you, is what is your favorite kind of engineering? Engineering management is what I'm going to have to go with. Um, you know, that's what I started out as a project manager. That's what my degree actually is, is in. So, you know, managing projects, schedules, budgets, um, you know, it's played such an important part of my career, uh, but really where my passion is. Thank you. Now, sir, what is your favorite kind of engineering? Oh, that's, that's, I love the question. Uh, so, I, I'm, you know, hopefully it doesn't go too long, but I studied as a civil engineer. So that's kind of my love and where I started. Although I've served, served 24 plus years in the army in which I uh, didn't get to do a whole lot of that construction and that focus on building up. I've done more destruction and the combat engineering. Uh, and so, and I've loved that as well. And so, um, but then as I continued my study, I pursued a uh, professional engineer's license, a PE in environmental engineering. And so I think it kind of helped prepare me for, you know, what we talked about earlier and the environmental work we have to do across the nation, but specifically here in the Midwest. And so civil, combat, environmental. Honestly, I love it all. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like a trick question. All right. Between, so we talked about mussels, oysters, and salmon, because I talked to Portland, you, and obviously you're from Norfolk District. So if you had to rate them, your most favorite to your less than most favorite between mussels, oysters, and salmon, using any scale you like, deliciousness, or the, you like the, the look of them, it doesn't matter. Susan, what is your top favorite from mussels, oysters, or salmon? I immediately went to food because I like to cook, so I'm going to go with salmon as my top. <laughs> Sir, mussels, oysters, or salmon? Well, I'm going to have to go with the local favorite here, mussels, uh, and they are good to eat as well. I just don't have them as often, and so when I do, I really enjoy them. <laughs> he's, he's, uh, he's playing the local audience. I see. I see it. Okay. Now, here's the bonus question, the final question. Other than the St. Louis district, what is your second, because we'll assume St. Louis is first, what is your second favorite district? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I'm gonna play it safe and say I have no favorite district, but uh, we do work with a lot of others. Um, you know, uh, Jacksonville district, which we mentioned, Sacramento district, um, all the districts with MV MVD are great. Um, we have great relationships, great partnerships there. Uh, you know, so I would be remiss to call out any one district. We'll get an answer out of her. We'll have to we'll have to follow up. All right, sir. You cannot pick St. Louis. What is your favorite district? Okay, well, since Susan played it safe, I'm gonna go out uh, on a limb here. And so I'll explain my first experience with the Corps of Engineers was out in the Pacific Ocean Division. And I got a chance to go visit the Alaska district. And so what a great state and what a great uh, district up there. Um, we don't directly do any work with them, you know, maybe some tribal relations and and some you know work. Um, that we could do with uh, curation and archaeology management. You know, we're always willing to work with all of the districts, really. And so maybe that's my hook to maybe try to get a tie-in to Alaska and partner with them. Uh, but, you know, we, it, it is exciting because uh, so many districts have so much um, history and heritage. And, and again, that's where I have really gained appreciation for is how much enterprise work is done. Susan mentioned Jacksonville and Sacramento. Uh, when, and you know, they are given a mission. We have done work in Alaska, Alaska District. Um, Environmental Munitions Branch, we have a group that works for them and travels in the past has traveled up there on a regular basis. One of the one of the trips I've tried to get along. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, we're excited to work with all, all districts across the board. So. But you know, Alaska District, no one's gonna talk smack on Alaska. Like no one's gonna do that. So that's a safe pick, sir, because they're like, you know what? <laughs> 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 
you so much for the three of you for being here, for playing along. Hey, Susan. So thanks again for, for joining. Um, you know, she was explaining to me yesterday when we think that she was doing these podcasts at the course and I just didn't, I didn't maybe have the courage or didn't take time to do it. And so, uh, the Portland district commander was sitting next to me, Colonel Mike Helton. He did a follow up like this. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so easy to have conversations and talk with people in the core because everyone's passionate. They have great stories just from doing what they love to do and working with other good people. So the story kind of, you know, sells itself. But uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna thank you guys for the time that you put in talking to me today. Thanks for your time. All right, thank, thank you. you. We'll talk to you soon. All right, All right. Bye now. Goodbye. Hey friends, this is Future Andy here. I wanted to drop in before this next segment and give you all a little bit of context. So this is my interview with Major General David Hill, who is the Deputy Commanding General of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And um, I asked him what's in it for the taxpayer when it comes to events like the DCC. Kind of, you know, what's in it for them? So we started off with that question. What you'll also notice from this segment is that I quickly learned I can't have my son playing Xbox while trying to record a segment with um, a two-star general. So yeah, lessons learned, sir, I'm sorry. Still good content, you'll still like it, uh, you'll still get a lot from it, so here you go. Sure. Um, those are great questions. I think um, the, the, what what they get is uh, leaders that are more prepared to do the important work that we've asked them to do over the next couple of years, leading, uh, hel helping lead districts that are delivering key programs for our nation that keep us strong, and to do that in a way where they're good stewards of public resources uh, and maintaining a healthy climate in their organization. And, and just better understanding um, how they fit as uh, really regional or national leaders at their local level. And I think uh, as with any opportunity to come together for education and training, uh, another important takeaway I think for the deputies as well as for me is that both within our deputies community practice and in our district commanders, we probably turn over, I would guess, uh, around 40, 35 to 40 percent of those individuals in any given year. And so, um, and, and ideally we have them for two or three years in their assignments. And so when you can bring a cohort together like we did there that are coming on board around the same time into key positions uh, to, to meet the leaders that will be guiding organizations to their left and their right, um, that uh, relationship personally and and knowing knowing each other and having the ability to pick up the phone and call a friend uh, as you're trying to figure out you know maybe a, a unique uh, situation in your organization and how someone else worked through it or um, to, to collaborate together on shared solutions for uh, for regional issues or challenges perhaps um, I think are key takeaways so relationships um, better understanding of the, the, the mis their mission in the context of the Corps uh, processes and, and the opportunity to um, move forward encouraging their workforce and uh, stewarding resources in the manner that we expect as a world-class organization. I, I think that's an interesting point that people outside the USAIS organization, the DOD, might not understand. You're talking about, I don't want to say turnover rate, but you know, how, how, how often does that change and new people come in? Well, uh, most of our, our um, district commands in the Army Corps of Engineers are three-year commands. There's a few select ones that are two-year commands. So commanders um, you know, have an opportunity to, to build tenure and experience over typically a three-year command opportunity. And the deputies that support them, um, I would say, probably trend more towards the two-year command tour, um, two-year assignments and then uh, at times perhaps can stay longer or perhaps leave shorter if the army got their um, eyes on them for 
some other key and important position. Was there something that you personally took away from the DCC that was that you're like, wow, that was that really stood out to me? Uh, certainly, I think the, you know, the, the district commanders that were at this, what we call phase two of their um, district commanders course, because we do one for them in June, typically each year as well. So perhaps right before they assume responsibility as commanders. And then we um, reconvene with them at about the 90 day mark in command. And so, you know, they have spent 90 days um, seeking to gain an understanding of their organization, their mission, uh, and, and, and then providing assessment back to us uh, in a dialogue at that forum and in advance of that forum. And so one thing that, that is important for me as a senior leader is, you know, with, with uh, over 40 districts across the United States, and overseas, uh, the ability for, for me to be on the ground in every one of those and understand that is, is um, it's just an impossibility, right? And so uh, the, the opportunity to learn from them and understand uh, their priorities, their focus, and where they need help from the national headquarters of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, to, to better improve processes align resources or understand their challenges in delivering the program is invaluable. And so it's a two way street. There's uh, uh, as, as we went through the week, um, we were able to bring in uh, individuals that are senior leaders within the core here at our national headquarters to share perspective and best advice for commanders. And then we also were able to bring in some external stakeholders to um, share their perspectives about doing business with the core. And so uh, listening to that uh, back and forth, the really insightful questions that our district commanders ask um, is encouraging because it lets me uh, or helps me understand how quickly they grasp the complexities of their um, organizations and missions and really how well prepared they are to lead those organizations in partnership with the great team that's that's already there on the ground. So let me explain to me the, the dynamic between a district command and community or commonwealth in which he or she serves. I'm going to ask Andrea if I make sure I understood this because you again we're broken. You said the the relationship between the district commander and the the state or region that they serve. Yes. Yeah. So uh, district commanders and their senior civilian leadership within their district carry a heavy responsibility for us um, to strengthen uh, partnerships and relationships in the regions that they're called to serve. So we recognize in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, in, in delivering um, big projects and programs for our nation that we don't do that alone. And so, so the commanders carry a heavy responsibility of understanding um, different stakeholder perspectives, uh, project sponsors' perspectives, uh, and, and their own team's um, approach to delivering solutions to the nation's toughest challenges. And, and that, uh, they're, they're key connective tissue for us in making this whole, um, you know, this whole body work together in a way that, that, that wins, right? Which we have said is finishing quality projects on time and, and in budget. And uh, I think that's the importance of them at the district commander's level, knowing um, everyone from governors in the states where they reside to state emergency managers to installation commanders uh, or leaders of major organizations in the interagency that we support. Excellent. So last, is there anything else you'd like to add that I didn't ask or anything else? it's important to the audience well just uh i very much appreciated norfolk's uh hard work to host that event the district commanders conference running simultaneously with the i'm sorry the district commanders course running simultaneously with the deputies uh course that we did there uh you know we, that's a hard thing to do anytime. It's certainly uh, e even harder when you're trying to plan through all the variables and protect the force in a COVID environment. 
um, you know, I, I think uh, the, the team worked for months to engage with uh, speakers to help shape agendas to inform commanders on all the logistics and from my perspective Norfolk just knocked it out of the park and did a great job and and I'm thankful for that and thankful for them uh, who you know choose to serve with the Corps and and make a difference in uh, everything that we do and certainly in, in key um, initiatives like our district commander Corps. This is the this is the first time in core talk history. We we don't have a long history, but I mean it's the first time. Um, you have you um have won an award that we just made up like a couple a uh, couple minutes ago. Um, so you know we have the the district commanders coming in and and everybody's you know they're talking about their district and their people and they're proud of of their folks but um you ha have gone above and beyond and we you so your prize is you are going to have your own chapter of the podcast wow. one, the most shameless self-promoting district in the core of engineering <laughs> and, <laughs> so congratulations sir uh make sure you tell your team i you you guys are the big winners today <laughs> that, that is amazing news that that's the best news i've had all week I, i'm definitely i'm i think i'm gonna call alan davis right after this and uh and let him know I, I have no doubt. I agree. I, I think they're going to come up with an amazing oh, yeah. name for it. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was even, I was talking with some other folks. I'm like, ah, yeah, I think Portland's going to win this. I had, I like you were, you were who I was betting on. So, and you, you, you didn't fail me, sir. You delivered <laughs> exactly what I thought. So yeah. And, we, and you're, you're, you're amazing. And you know, <laughs> I, uh, I, I am absolutely nothing again without my team of 1500, almost 1500 amazing professionals that, uh, that get the mission done every day. And so, I, uh, I, I'm the, I'm the guy that gets to do stuff like this, right? So I, I'm extremely fortunate in that, but, uh, the, the, the backbone is our, our people getting the mission done every day. And that completes our November, 2020 episode, Dredging for Compliments. Please remember to like, share, follow, comment, post, publish, whatever verb you need to help us spread the word about Core Talk. Don't forget to tune in next month for our final episode of season one. We are super excited. And we'd like to thank all of you who were listening to us way back in January and have followed as we've evolved and changed and modified and done our best to give you the quality product that you deserve. We'd like to take a moment to thank the following folks whose work and perseverance helps make this show and other shows happen. For our segment regarding the DCC, Colonel Patrick Kinsman, Mr. Mark Haviland, Eric Silva, Barry Spence, and Ben from Logistics, whose last name I can't remember right now, but I'm so sorry, but I will figure that out and I will make sure I give you props next time. From the Little Rock District, Major C.T. Warren, the folks from the St. Louis District, Major General David Hill. Sir, I'm so sorry the audio was terrible. And you haven't heard the last of him yet. Colonel Mike Helton, the commander of the Portland District. So next month, we'd like to actually uh, play that recording of our interview with Colonel Helton. If you get a chance to check out anything in between now and then, go ahead and check out Portland District, District's social media platforms. They do an outstanding job. It just blows me away every time. So I'm sure you'll like it as well. Everybody, stay warm, stay safe. And until next time, this is Core Talk. Core Talk is the official podcast of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Core Talk constitutes permission to use that content as part of the broadcast. 
Court Talk is recorded at the Norfolk District Headquarters building in Norfolk, Virginia, and is produced by the district's public affairs staff.